Dr. Ford for giving me the opportunity. Um, Dr. Ford tells me that the name of this class is American Crime, and uh, you guys are taking this class in the United States of America. So forget about drones, forget about <laughs> artificial intelligence, forget about technology. American crime is a trillion dollar a year industry, so you're in the right class. Some of you will pursue uh, fields in the criminal justice system, law enforcement, or many of the cottage industries that surround it. Um, those industries are paralegals and stenographers and clerks, law clerks, uh, lawyers, judges, uh, people in the field, criminal justice systems uh, like uh, sheriff's office, um, you name it, it goes out, probation, counseling, parole. Um, the United States is, is great and has been great for over 200 years in a lot of different things. And criminal justice system, regulatory issues are no different. We're the leaders. Never in the history of mankind do we incarcerate and put people through prison like we do in the United States of America. Over four million people are under the jurisdiction of some thumbprint, whether felons or under parole or probation. Over two million people are incarcerated right now, about 2.3 million people. If you're someone of color, you're probably over 50% chance in some time in your life of dealing with or being incarcerated. If you're a black male, you have a one in three chance of being incarcerated. The US, United States has 5% of the world's population <coughs> and 25% of its prison population. So American crime and what you're learning here, Dr. Ford not only wants you to learn about statistics and all the metrics and all the procedures <coughs> and the follows up into law that will help you choose your majors and help you learn about society, each one of you will, will have either direct or indirect confrontation with law enforcement in, in, some, in some time of your life or root regulations or what have you. And so everybody in here will hopefully learn something during this course. So I have a good friend, uh, Paul Young, who is the author of The Shack. He, he, he authored it back in 2008, 2009, and he actually just pr produced the movie. And uh, he's a world-renowned speaker. He goes all over the world. He's got a great story. And I'm not a professional speaker, but he tells me that the best way to educate people is by telling a story. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna walk through a little story with you and uh, have patience with me. And uh, hopefully you'll learn a little something today. Very good. Let's give him a big welcome for coming. <laughs> So my name is Vince McCrudden. I, I kind of look the same on that picture. I'm not aging at all. I've never taken a while. So it says here that I, I've had a 25 Wall Street career. So I, wor I worked on Wall Street. I started in the mid-1980s. I started on the floors of the commodity exchange. I started in derivatives when derivatives were just starting in the interbank market. I have, in the course of my 25 years, I have either executed and or traded hundreds of billions of dollars of sophisticated financial instruments, including derivatives, for the top financial institutions in the world. During all that time, I have never had one single solitary customer complaint. In 2008, 2009, I started my own little small hedge fund. It was a multi-strategy hedge fund and it had a 138 net audited return during that time. And if you remember back in 2008, 2009, we were going through a huge world financial crisis that kind of started right here in the United States uh, due to mortgages and derivatives and, and so forth uh, that, that initiated and originated on Wall Street. In the years uh, 1997 to 2000, going back a little bit, um, I actually ran a little fund, a little commodity pool. Back then, it started with about $200,000. It got up to about $1.2 million. And my little, uh, my little pool was the victim of fraud in the copper markets by some of the biggest banks in the world, Sumitomo Bank, JP Morgan, um, 
Credit Lee and A, Merrill Lynch. Unfortunately, the fund uh, didn't, didn't make it, and so I, ha I was forced to close the, the fund down. During that process, I became a lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit. I worked with Scotland Yard to investigate the fraud on a global scale, and I also had to answer to a former assistant U.S. attorney who was acting as a lawyer for one of the uh, investors. And so over the course of three years, he started sending me threatening letters wanting to know um, where, how much I was making, what my house is worth, what my wife made, all these types of things. Uh, after about three years, I got tired of it, and I told him to F off, which was, was a great <laughs> idea. So as I said, I, 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 starting 1997, I saw that a, a lawyer was working on a class action lawsuit. I became, a, because of my knowledge in the industry, I became a lead plaintiff in this class action lawsuit against very, very powerful uh, banks who, who don't like that sort of thing. And so that's for the first time in my career, I kind of raised my uh, profile. But this class is called American Crime. Dr. Ford didn't invite me here today to tell you about Wall Street. He, he, he brought me in here today because in the year 2000, I stopped being Vince McCrudden and I became number 585-88053 in the Bureau of Prison Systems. In 2000, in May of 2000, I was arrested by the FBI and the US Postal and Loretta Lynch and I was charged with 15 counts of mail fraud. I didn't steal any money. They weren't accusing me of stealing any money. What I did was I went to my regulators and I asked them, how should I account for the possible class action reward in the, in the defunct hedge fund that I ran? I simply utilized that accounting methodology for a number of months. The fund was already closed, but yet I was arrested. The day that I was arrested, the, that former U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney that I told to not so nicely go somewhere, well, he called my attorney and he said, I had your boy arrested. So one of the things we, we want to think about today, what Dr. Ford wants you to think about in, in, in stories, is that how do cases arise? How do they get to prosecution? How do they lead to indictment? And we're hopefully we'll tell you a little bit about how that, how that happened. So in a technicality, the government withdrew their case without prejudice after 33 days. Technically, they had 30 days to bring an indictment. So after 33 days, they did it. So we thought, you know, it was good or what have you. They withdrew it. I thought I was through something. My, my record was tainted forever. I hadn't disclosed that on all of my licenses and my financial career would never be the same again, even though it was just allegations at that point and just the charge. For a personal note, just so you guys know, I'm probably one of a few thousand people that uh, am twice survivor of World Trade Center attacks. I worked in the World Trade Center in February 1993, and I was there in 9-11-2001 in building one on the 26th floor, and I lost 23 uh, friends that day. I miss those buildings, they were beautiful buildings. I worked most of my career down there. So in May 2002, that class action lawsuit that I told you about, which I was lead plaintiff, settled. And my investors received $900,000, $100,000 more than they totally invested. But that's not what the government, the former assistant US attorney cared about. They cared about getting their pound of flesh from me after being disrespectful to one of theirs. So I was rearrested, indicted, and now charged just under statute of limitations for the exact same 15 counts of mail fraud. So at this point, the fund is closed, the investors got more than their money back, but they still wanted their pound of flesh from me. In September 2003, so here's a little bit of a note before I get into that. In the federal court system, I, I know Dr. Ford will take, you know, teach you about a lot of different things, but in the federal system, the numbers are staggering. 
91% of people who are defendants in a, in a criminal process in the federal system plead guilty. 98.6 of defendants are found guilty. It's like shooting ducks in a barrel. The day that you're indicted in a federal case, the numbers are stacked against you from day one. But I, being completely innocent, was not going to take any plea deal. I wanted to have my day in court. I wanted to explain what happened. And I took a huge chance. I faced, I had two young children, and I faced six years in prison of the, one, the total $1.2 million, the $800,000 that was invested, and I made a 52% rate of return during that time. That was the number, the 1.2 million was what the government was charging me for, the um, total amount that was <coughs> at stake. I didn't steal a penny, I'm not saying I stole a penny, but that under federal law, under the intended losses, is how they calculate is how they calculate losses, even though there's $900,000 sitting in the bank. And so, under for $1.2 million for 50 counts of mail fraud, I faced six years in prison. So it was obviously very uh, nerve-wracking. So, um, after a two and a half week trial, I testified on my own behalf. I was acquitted of all charges within an hour. Um, one of my relatives had ran into one of the jurors at a supermarket, I think that week or what have you, and she stated to him that it was obvious to us that the government and those rich investors were trying to make Mr. McCrudden the fall guy. Quite a statement for a juror, a citizen, to sit um, in judgment of, of somebody and to be able to, to say that. I think it was very powerful. So in I said to you that I've been in Wall Street since 1985. Now I had to navigate. I had been arrested once in 2000. I was rearrested in 2002. I had to disclose all that on the record, the whole thing, the charges, mail fraud. Mail fraud charges in, in the financial arena is like a death sentence. You can, you can virtually uh, unemployable. So very difficult to navigate. But being Irish and being pig-headed, being stubborn, I was like, F them, I'm gonna go try. So I did, I said, I'm getting my licenses back. My licenses had lapsed, I had held my, I had, at that point, I had other NASD securities licenses that were untouched, but they, this stuff was on the record. I had securities licenses for 7, 24, 55, and 63, which I, I was very proud of, and, and I obtained them. But my commodity license was my first license. It was very important to me. And I had it since 1985, and I was hell-bent on getting it back. I took the test, I passed it, I went to petition the NFA, which is the self-regulatory body, to give me my license back, and they denied it for a catch-all phrase for the exact same thing I just went for, and they called it for a good cause. So after they denied my licenses, I, I wasn't happy, but I was learning more and more about the system now. So I was learning about the regulatory system, and I was learning about the US criminal justice system at the same time, and I wasn't happy with either. So um, I called the NFA, and, and I was looking at my appeals, and I said, uh, can you do me a favor and give me all the discovery you have over all the years for, for whatever you have on me so that I could appeal it? and do, I have mandatory appeals to a, a federal reg, regulatory agency, this Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and then ultimately to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. He told me, piss off, we're done with you. So I didn't learn my lesson, so I told Tim, F you, I'm coming out to Chicago, I'm gonna kick your ass, something along those lines. Uh, he didn't like that, like the AUSA before didn't like that, and they have very powerful friends. So what did he do? A couple months later, he, I got a call from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. They were gonna prosecute me for Title 18, 875C, sending threatening communications via the internet commerce. I both verbally sent it to him and I actually wrote it in an email. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know you guys are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm gonna go to jail again, um, but, the U.S. Attorney figures, okay, we're gonna give this guy a break, 
And so they do what's called a diversion agreement. Instead of indicting me and charging me, they say, we'll work out a deal with you. You'll be on a diversion agreement for two years. You can attend anger management courses at your own expense. At the end of that two years, if you don't mess up again, we'll dismiss the case against you. Okay, I got no choice. Um, they had to be dead to rights. I, I did violate the law, um, and so it was brave. And so I did the two years. Um, I went to anger management counseling um, every day. And I actually, my counselor at the time was, uh, uh, worked in the uh, Veterans Administration, had been for 40 years. And uh, his advice to me was, just shut up. The government's corrupt. Get over it. I'm like, okay, all right. During this time, 2006, 2008, and when I'm starting my new hedge fund, um, I told you earlier that I had securities licenses for 7, 24, 55, and 63. Those are regulated by the, the government uh, agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, very big, very powerful agency. And they also have a self-regulatory uh, agency. It's like a quasi-government agency, similar to the National Futures Association, called FINRA. It used to be called uh, NASD. Anyway, during the time that I worked in 2006 for this firm, um, they had stolen like over $100,000 from me in commissions that was due me. I got into a little fight with the principals to give me back my money. I wrote some nasty things, not threatening things, but there was like a disagreement whether I was fired or whether I quit. This was so important to FINRA that two years later, they decide to investigate it. They go through all of my emails, and they see that there's a technicality there. Did, was Vincent McCrudden fired or did he resign? So they do this big investigative case for two years to determine whether I was fired or I resigned. And so in, um, it would cost me over $100,000, you know, because I, I, I wanted to fight it. My licenses were lapsed because you need to keep your licenses and continue in education for two years. So it was actually redundant. I fought because I thought it was a ridiculous case and they were, they were actually now coming, coming after me. Um, at this point in time, I, I went down to Washington, D.C. I met with elected officials. Um, I spoke at industry events, CFTC events uh, in the public. I became a little bit of an activist. I started a, a, a blog. I started to learn and research more and more about the U.S. financial regulatory uh, industry and, and the U.S. criminal justice system. So as I told you earlier, in May 2008 to December, uh, December 2009, I ran a very successful hedge fund. It was very, very difficult, as I said to you. There was a lot of strikes against me. You could very easily Google my name and all this bad stuff uh, would, would come up. Uh, and so I had to really kind of sell myself and my abilities and my experience on Wall Street for investors to give me a chance. And I performed. I made a 99.6% rate of return in 2008. Um, independent databases like Bloomberg had ranked at number two in the world for multi-strategy hedge funds. And in 2009, it made another 37% net audited rate of return. And, um, September 2009, the two federal agencies that I talked to you about, the CFTC and the SEC, subpoenaed all of my records. I spoke to the SEC lawyer at the time and I said, what, what, what the hell are you doing? I have a great rate of return and the world's crumbling, Rome's burning in the background. What do you, what do, you do with my little fund? He said, well, your, your returns were too good to believe. So they subpoenaed my administrators, auditors, banks, clearing firms, everybody they could touch, even limited partners, which is very rarely done. When you already have some type of history, you're trying to convince people that you're a good guy and you're doing the right thing, and I put up an army in front of me thinking they'll never touch me again. I'll make sure I have all the best lawyers, professionals in front of me so that they'll never jump over and get me. And I was wrong. I was wrong. So I, I, I lost the fund in December 2009 because um, investors, when there's any kind of uh, disruption or investigations, they want to withdraw their money. They want their cash back in their bank, and so I, I did that. Uh, I still had the track record, but my fund was closed, and I was gonna have to figure out another way to make a living. In August 2010, uh, I was uh, deposed by the CFTC, so, 
uh, in, so this is almost a year later, they come back and depose me, and um, they depose me and ask me, and basically their questions, uh, again, not any fraud, not any accusations of stealing money, it was all very, very documented. They wanted to know if I was registered or exempted from register registration properly. That was, their, that was their big case. The fund was already closed, they succeeded in what they wanted to do initially, but again, because I had raised my profile, because I was kind of an activist in the industry, they were determined to make sure that they destroyed my, my career. So, uh, me and, and, and my fiance at the time, I was divorced in 2006, unfortunately. Um, uh, she works at a very large European bank. We decided, let's get the hell out of here. I'm not gonna be able to navigate in this country. They're just gonna, they're just gonna continue to harass me and come after me. So we moved to Singapore. Um, she worked well, with her bank, and I was going to try to see if I could run more of a global um, hedge fund with the track record that, that I previously had. Not long in Singapore, <coughs> four months later, in December 2010, a friend of mine in Singapore says, hey, Vin, this doesn't look good. What's this? I read it. The CFTC sued me for registration. They called it simple registration violations, but not so simple. They sued me for $58 million. Now, to give you uh, an indication of how much money that is, my, my total fund at its height was $15 million in, in assets under management. I only make a percentage of the profits. I make 1% management fee, which is like $150,000 a year. I had three people working for me. I had offices. And then I was hiring all these lawyers, accountants, administrators. So, you know, net, even though I made 100% in returns over, what ha over that period of time, it wasn't all my money. But at that time, I was probably worth maybe four to six million dollars on paper. I still owe taxes, stuff like that. So I had ramped up in my career and I was sitting, you know, I was sitting pretty, pretty good. But it was all going to be taken from me if these guys uh, had, their, had their way. So here I am in Singapore, 10,000 miles away. These guys are suing me again. So I took my company website at the time. It really just had, it was like a, a credit, it was like a business card. Just had my basic contact information and, and the performance of my fund. And then I utilized that and I started to blog against the CFTC and the SEC and all these people uh, again to raise awareness and I, I did a, a check, and I, I kind of uh, did a um, tracer, and I found the IP addresses that the people were looking at my website. And from when I closed the fund in 2009, there was probably less than 100 hits a month. In December 2010, there were over 3,000 hits a month. When I looked at the IP addresses, almost ev everybody in the top 10 was some form of law enforcement or regulatory agency. I guess back in those days, you could go right back to the IP address and see exactly who was the location and the address of the IP address of who was looking at you. Um, I, I, again, not, not the smart guy, I said, screw these guys, I'm gonna do a spoof on the FBI most wanted list, and I'm gonna write all these people over all these years, I'm gonna write their names on this blog, I know they're watching, I'm gonna write their names, and I'm gonna call it, let me see, I'm gonna call it an execution list. <laughs> But I put a little asterisk on it, and, I, and, and, I, and the, 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 the term execution I used was a form or a formal plan to carry out. So I knew they were watching. Yes, I, I was really going up against the uh, First Amendment rights, but I, 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 was, I, was, I was angry. And they were watching. They were watching, and they didn't like it at all. So in December 19, 2010, my wife calls me in a panic, Singapore. She said, my ex-wife, sorry, she calls me in a panic and says, Vincent, there is like an army of cars here. The FBI and the and, and local police, uh, we live in, they live in a gated community at the time, just came in with sirens blazing. They raided the house and they interrogated my 19-year-old daughter who was home alone from college. I'm guessing it was either a search warrant or arrest warrant based on what I had written in Singapore. Now, the thing about it was, I, had, I was forced, I hadn't lived there in four years. I'm 10,000 miles away, certainly the government knows that, and they interrogate my 19-year-old daughter. Uh, as any parent would be, I was, I was very, very, very angry. I was aware they were probably baiting me, 
but I, I kind of continue my provocative language on the website, knowing now fully that they, they are indeed watching. So I had to get a lawyer, figure out what was going on. I took a 19-hour direct flight from Singapore, and as soon as I landed, there were 40 armed federal agents waiting for me. They took me right off the plane door. They arrested me, and uh, I was held in a, in a local jail. I went to court, federal court, the next day in the Eastern District of New York, and I was charged with two counts of Title 18, 875C, you guessed it, threatening communications via the internet commerce, my favorite charge. <laughs> I am indicted, and I am denied bail. The judge doesn't like me, because he's a federal employee too. These guys tend to stick together, and he's not gonna tolerate me threatening government officials, or quasi-government officials. So they took me to uh, a for-profit, publicly traded prison. Maybe you've heard of it, GEO or CCA or Core Civic. it's called now. They're traded on the New York Stock Exchange. They're worth billions of dollars. People invest in them. They have one, they have one product, human beings, and they have one client, the United States government or state government. And so uh, as 585-88053, I was locked in basically a warehouse near JFK Airport at this for-profit prison and my life as I, as I knew it was basically over. Um, in June 2011, another federal agency, the IRS, audited me for the periods of 2006 to 2011. So I've got CFTC suing me for $58 million. I'm stuck locked up 23-7 with real criminals, gang, gang members, cartel members, murderers. Uh, and so uh, I was in a real deal. I, I, I was allowed out one hour for, for recreation in a very, very small gym, and then they had a little outside plot. It is a very, very bleak period of my life, I can tell you. There is absolutely, I think it was Dr. Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela says that prison is all the necessities of life without the beauties of life. And I can, I can tell you he was 100% uh, correct. Ultimately, the IRS, a few years later, um, had worked with my fiance to get all the material they needed and then, in not so many words, they, they were told that they were told to come get me, to, to see if they could you know, mess me up. And these IRS agents, moral and ethical as they were, said, we're just gonna do wherever it leads us. Ultimately, they would, I would get back $75,000, which would be much needed. In July 2000, so I'm, I'm sitting in jail for six months, I'm trying to fight the case. Um, I was told through rulings, I could see it for myself every time that I went to court, that we were, the reason that there's a 98.6% conviction rate in the federal court, part of it is due to how, not so much the letter of the law, you have to understand that most laws, and, and mostly in the federal court, are made for an objectional standard, meaning that it's not so much the intent or mens rea, that you violated this law regardless of what your intentions were, and that's all, that's all the government has to prove, that's all the jurors have to prove. And so a federal judge makes sure that they stay along those lines and that's why they're very, very successful. Unfortunately, I was told, I didn't understand the system, I was told I faced 30 years in prison. Um, and so I, w I became one of the 91% the who took the plea deal from the government with the uh, so federal sentencing guideline range of 21 to 27 months in prison. I had already served six months, good time, and what have you. I figured I'd be out hopefully you know, fairly soon. Maybe, maybe the judge would give me a break. Um, and I took a chance. My children came in prison to see me. It was breaking my heart, my fiance, my family. Uh, they all, as much as I wanted to fight it, and I would very much believe that even though I think I tested the very boundaries of the First Amendment, I did want to fight it in court. I was willing to take the chance to go to court, but um, I, I listened to family and friends and uh, decided to uh, take a plea deal. So in April 2012, I am sentenced to 28 months in federal prison. 
I'm sentenced to two years of supervised release, which is very, very important. They don't tell you about that part. And um, lo and behold, I got to take another anger management course because obviously I'm a very, very angry guy. <laughs> In October 2012, I am released from prison. I ended up being transferred at some point. I did 14 months in that hellhole, which is GEO, near, near that warehouse. Um, I went to a, a, a real real prison, Fort Dix in New Jersey, which time was better, it was outdoor. I can tell you that, um, I remember the day they pulled me out of the prison, said, you're going, and I got on a bus, and just to be outdoors and see the rain and see the air and see the sky and see trees, I mean, I was only in 14 months, but it felt amazing. It's funny how everything's relative. You just, you take your freedom for granted. You take the world and life and the beauties of life for granted. And when it's taken from you, then it's shown to you again. You're like, oh my God, this is so great. Even though I'm shackled uh, in my hands and my feet. Um, but I, I end up going to Fort Dix. I walk out of that bus and it's, it's just a slow rain and I could smell the grass and I could still uh, imagine that day to day, and it, it felt it felt great to be out of that place. <clears throat> so in January 2013, I start my two years. I'm done with my prison part of my sentence, and I start my anger management classes and and federal supervised release. So, do you think I learned my lesson? No, no. hell no, no. I come out and I'm just like, all right, I learned quite a lot about the U.S. regulatory system. I've learned quite a lot about the U.S. criminal justice system. I don't think I'm a predator. I don't think I'm a bad guy. Okay, every now and again I have a bad temper. I say a few choice words to the wrong people. But I'm not the guy you should be afraid of. I'm not. I mean, I'm not really a felon, am I? So I say, you know, I'm going to fight like I always do. So I started, I learned a lot in prison, you know, jailhouse lawyers, what have you. I read a lot you know, a lot of stuff, I did a lot of reading in there, and I decided I'm, uh, I'm gonna play in their ball field, and then some. So I sue everybody, I sue, I sue everybody. Uh, I initiate three federal tort claims against um, the NFA, the CTC, the SEC, I sue Loretta Lynch herself, uh, because she had indicted me in 2000, and she was the one who arrested me in 2011, so she had a particular interest in, in me. Um, and, and I sued him under what's called a Bivens claim. So I could sue the United States of America, but under Bivens, I could sue them individual in their individual capacity. It's a very, very high bar to sue a federal official. As long as they're basically in pursuit of a law or a statute, they have absolute immunity. It's very, it's very rare uh, to get through uh, dismissal motions in, in, a, in a federal tort claim. So I, 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 I can't sue, you're not allowed to sue a federal judge, so I figure what's the next best thing? Well, I'm gonna make his life a, a living hell, and at least paperwork anyway. So I submit multiple bias and partiality and judicial complaints against the district court judge who threw me in prison. Um, I, I send it to the, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which was my appellate court, and I send it to the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee. Um, I also author and I publish a book. And I named it Leverage and Extortion, One Man's Story of How the US, oh, US Government Operates. I reach out to elected officials, I look up all the staff emails, uh, Senate staff, congressional staff, and I just <coughs> write all stuff. I include, my, I include all my tort claims and lawsuits and what happened to me and the pursuit over me over all these years. Um, and I reach out to the, to the media. Um, none of it, none of the tort claims, none of the media, none of the reaching out to elected officials um, went, it, went anywhere. I can tell you when I was wealthy, when I was worth 46 million, I played the game, I went down to Washington, uh, I met these go-between guys and they said the best way to do it is to you know, buy a table at their charity. So I bought a couple of 10, $20,000 tables, brought people down to try to get the ear. And I did, I got the ear of certain congressmen. But during investigations, they, they had told me, and I had hired a lawyer as well, they did tell me that I, I was a target of, of certain government officials who didn't like me, but ultimately they weren't going to touch me. They weren't going to help me. And ultimately 
They did it then, and they, and they wouldn't now. In November 11, 2014, I'm good, real, real good email writer, excellent email writer. So I send out 200 emails to Senate and their staff about because President Obama had nominated Loretta Lynch, and you know she had charged me with the crime in 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 2000 and 2002 and, and lost, and now she's going to be the top cop. She's going to be the U.S. Attorney General. No way, no way. So I I, I write letters stating including my lawsuit to Senate and their staff. I write it to uh, the media. Um, and, and so this is, I think, I think it's Friday, November 11th. So what do you think happens? <laughs> November 14th, at 6 a.m. in the morning, 25 FBI and U.S. Marshals break down my door. My, my fiance's there and my deaf sister's staying with me in another room. They arrest me. And they ultimately charged me with, you guessed it, 875, Title 18, 875C, and 876C because some of them went through the mails. What they did was they took all of my activism efforts over those two years, they took nine pleadings of actual court documents, and they used them stating that over two years that some of them were what's called true threats. That's what... That's what the burden of the government is, true threat. But there's a lot of criteria to prove true threat. I'm sure most of you are very, very active, and it's time for another class, maybe topic, very important to you in your lives, in that true threats is the criteria the federal government will, will, will catch you on if you write anything that fits the criteria of true threats on, on, on the internet. So I, I think I know of one, of one case. In the minute that you send it, typically, you might be in Florida and send it to your, 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 your homie you know, <coughs> down the block, but the server's located in, in Utah. So as long as that email crosses state lines and comes back, even though it's down the block, that's a federal crime. So you've got to be very, very careful about what you write. Um, I'm denied bail again. Back to prison. I spend more, I've spent uh, four months locked down in the Brooklyn MDC, some of the worst criminals you can imagine. That's where El Chapo is right now, I believe. Um, for, <laughs> oh, he's a hero, I didn't know that. Uh, for badness, they put a managerial variable on me and they put a public safety factor. So they make sure I'm locked down 23-7. They treat me like uh, El Chapo, probably. <laughs> In March 2015, I'm acquitted of all charges. None of those pleadings to the court violated true threats, Title 18, 875C. I have now, unbelievably, in a, in a, in a federal government where they convict 98.6% of their defendants, I've now beaten them twice. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy. I'm in a very tough uh, a cell. I, I am serving uh, time with guys that are serving life sentences. Um, part, cartel members from all over the world, uh, mafia figures, uh, you know, who've killed many, many people. Uh, very, very, very tough uh, environment. Uh, for a guy, a Wall Street guy, um, it, it's an uh, eye-opening experience, I, I can tell you. So, although, although now I am acquitted, um, I'm acquitted by preponderance of evidence, and now I'm done with my supervised release, my original sentence, I should be free to pursue whatever's left of my life. But the government is still not done with me. They absolutely hate me. So what they did was that little raid they had on November 14, 2014, they took all of my phones, all of my computers, and they went through every single thing for as long as they wanted. And you know what they found? They found that I had a little folder called inmate correspondent. Some of the guys that I did time with, I actually communicated with. I communicated with, created, communicated with seven of them. But one in particular, a guy that I spent the first night in prison at that GEO prison in January 14, 2011, he, he didn't really have a chance in life. He was a really good guy. He was born to crack parents. Um, he was working at Home Depot. He was trying to make a living. He got laid off. He had a little baby, and he went back to what he had done twice before. He sold crack cocaine and to try to make a living, and he was uh, entrapped. Uh, he was arrested in a, in a, in a bus. Um, they set him up, which they do a lot right now. 
Uh, FBI agents uh, all over the country are uh, <coughs> entrapping people. They're on the computers trying to trap you with uh, child por pornography cases. They have informants working the streets. Uh, federal government, over 50% of who's in there are, are, are in and around crime. Another 60 